In today's episode of Crypto Over Coffee, the coolest and most caffeinated weekly crypto show on the internet, we're discussing the big question. Has the price of Bitcoin hit the bottom yet or is the worst yet to come? Of course, we also have our usual 404 Logic Not Found segment and more crypto news on the show today. So make sure you stick around for all the updates we've got in store for you. Now, if you like crypto, please subscribe to the channel and hit the bell notification button, or you can follow the podcast on your platform of choice, and you'll get a heads up whenever I post new episodes of the Crypto Over Coffee show every single weekend. And by the way, please, fair warning, make sure to watch out for scammers on social media and messaging apps that are impersonating me, pretending to be me, asking you for money or personal info, or just being weird and talking to you, especially in the YouTube comments. I don't have a WhatsApp. I'm not going to ask you to contact me, so please be careful. And a quick coffee break brought to you by Onyx Coffee Roasters, not sponsored. All right. So as we watch the price of Bitcoin sort of ranging between the high 20Ks and the low 30Ks and altcoins faltering to a greater degree, the question bouncing around in people's minds is whether Bitcoin has hit the bottom or if we're still searching for that price floor. You hear all kinds of opinions on this, but there are two major sides to the argument here. On one hand, you look at past bear markets like 2018, and you see lows 85% down from all time highs. And on the other hand, you have this fundamental belief that we've already hit bottom in this market after several catastrophic events have come and gone. And in between those two, you have a range of other opinions, of course, but that's par for the course. Of course, par for the course weird. It's also worth noting that the only way to know which side is definitively right is to play out in real time and see what happens. But we can always sort of intelligently speculate based on the information that we have today. If we look back to the 2018 bear market and the 2017 hype cycle before it, the peak of that cycle was several orders of magnitude smaller than where we are now in terms of total market cap and technology maturity. Back then, we were celebrating that 600 to 700 billion market cap for crypto as a whole, and then we rolled right back down below the 100 billion market cap when everything came apart in 2018. This cycle, we saw a peak of around $3 trillion market cap, representing a ton more growth than last time around. And this has been supported by retail FOMO, the entrance of institutions, and large-scale venture capital bringing huge, huge money into the mix to support young projects along with the coming of age of many of these projects that survived through 2017, 2018 into the 2020s and built all the way into that 2021 bull run. Because of the entrance of institutions, the ongoing investment from venture capital and the overall growth of the space, I don't think we're going to see the same six fold decrease in market cap for total crypto market cap like we did in 2018 this time around. Frankly, I would imagine that it's possible that we drop below $1 trillion as altcoins continue to sell off and projects exit, and then low conviction Bitcoin and Ether holders start to clear out. But my bottom target for market cap as a whole for crypto is no less than $800 billion. And, it, and that's if that, right? I mean, we saw the Luna Foundation Guard market dump tens of thousands of BTC, and it's a surprise that Bitcoin held up as well as it did with that. A dip into the $25,000 range wasn't surprising at all. I expected lower. Despite the clear need for the reset in this space, there are data points that signal a larger and larger core community holding major coins in cold storage with no intention of selling. Outflow from exchange. This is where the strength comes from in the market. The holders and convicted buyers absorbing the selling pressure at these key price points like 30K for Bitcoin. And when we drop into the 20Ks, it rolls right back. Invariably, we've hit this point in the crypto frenzy of a bull run where there was chaos, hundreds of new projects were launching per day, soaking up retail FOMO dollars, and then the party stopped. The retail investor got crushed and left. Then the VCs that were backing these projects are cutting back. Maybe they were backing off. Crypto companies have started to slow hiring and growth and even rescinding offers if you saw the Coinbase news. And then we enter crypto winter where we are today. And then we're going to have 12 to 24 months of building and resetting, and then things will roar back to life with consolidation, strength, and maturity. Many notable crypto personalities also say that a prerequisite to finding the bottom is to see crypto breaking correlation with the equities markets, which hasn't happened yet. But still, given macroeconomic environment right now and the composition of the crypto market players compared to 2018, I'm not surprised that we haven't seen that correlation breaking. 
I personally subscribe to the idea that the price floor is going to be at or near the previous cycle high, which would be around 20,000. And that's sort of a compromise between those who think we see 85% off of all time highs, which puts us in the range of 10, 11,000, and those who think we've already hit bottom in the mid 25, mid 20K, so like 25K. While I feel confident that the bottom will be in the range of the low 20Ks, the fact is no one knows for sure what's gonna happen. The events of the last eight months are a clear sign of that. You have no idea what's gonna happen. And it's time for an abundance of caution, a sort of measure three times, cut once type of thing. And the further tightening of the belt by the Federal Reserve and global central banks will only seek to deter the flow of capital into risky speculative assets of which the top of the bin is cryptocurrency. And that's an X factor that none of us can really predict either way. It could turn around or there could be more tightening. We don't know. What I will say is that I'm fairly confident that the worst of this is behind us. The cataclysm of the Terra Luna unraveling, the shock of shifting monetary policy, waning retail interest in crypto. We're feeling the chill of crypto winter, which has historically been a period of cleansing, building and rebirth for crypto. If you're anything like me, you're probably feeling just a bit irritated watching the snide media personalities and crypto critics taking this time to dunk on crypto investors and deride us as stupid children who deserve to lose all of our money. But it just makes the comeback that much more fun when it happens. I've set my portfolio up for the long haul, moving out of a large proportion of altcoins except a select handful and leaving plenty of USDC on the table for buying opportunities along the way. And beyond that, I've set conditional buys on my iTrust Capital IRA account to try to hit some of my target low prices. So the low 20 Ks for Bitcoin, for example, so I can build up my long-term positions in some of those blue chip coins like the Bitcoins and the ethers of the world. And by the way, if you are aware of the risks, you live in the United States and you want to set up a tax advantage retirement account for cryptocurrency, you can do so using the link in the description below my affiliate link for iTrust Capital. This video isn't sponsored by them, but I've been a user for a long time and this new conditional buy feature is now going to be a mainstay of this sort of bear market period for me. Regardless of that, the bottom line is this. Barring another unforeseen disaster like tether imploding or some wide ranging regulatory sweep of the space, I feel that the worst of this is behind us. We may yet see prices fall and market cap fall still to what will be the bottom of this, this cycle. But from here, it's a build back to a foundation for the next positive cycle for crypto. The Federal Reserve will not and cannot tighten forever, and there will be a loosening of the overall macroeconomic conditions that are largely holding down risk assets like this. It's just a matter of time. And until then, be smart, be safe, and double down on building your knowledge and skills in this space. And maybe when the next time comes around, if you want to work in crypto, you'll have those skills and you will be a fantastic hire for some of the greatest companies in this area. Now, it is time for 404 Logic Not Found. And for those of you who are as of yet uninitiated in this little firecracker of a segment, I highlight logical conundrums in the crypto space that need to get some attention. And speaking of attention, if you want to help this episode of Crypto Over Coffee get some attention from the algorithm robots, please hit the like button, get subscribed, follow the podcast, share it with a friend, because it tells all the robots that sort of control the show here that you're enjoying the content and others might as well. And if you enjoy hype-free crypto content, this is the place for you. Quick coffee break. Now, recently, the Federal Trade Commission, or FTC, released findings from research conducted on financial losses by consumers tied to crypto fraud and scams. The FTC in this sort of study found that between March 2021 and January 2022, over $1 billion were lost by consumers in crypto-related fraud. And interestingly, those affected are young and middle-aged people by a large degree from ages 20 to 49. That report also called out the top types of fraud, including bogus investment schemes, romance scams, and the tried and true government and business impersonation scams that we are all very familiar with in the sort of scammer and fraudster space. You get phone calls, you get emails, all sorts of stuff. Now, I'm not calling out this report or the FTC. This is great research, actually. This data is helpful to have and even more valuable to be used to clean up this space and educate those who even casually invest in crypto to protect themselves from scams. 
where the absence of logic begins is in the inevitable yet still pitiful attempts by crypto critics to seize this report as some sort of grand revelation that crypto is evil and should just be banned or otherwise crushed entirely by regulation and there will no there won't be any scams it's undeniably horrible that 1 billion has been stolen from innocent people by fraudsters and scammers and and the like there's no doubt but if anyone thinks the answer is to ban or destroy crypto to snuff out scams and fraud then they probably forgotten that scams and frauds are adaptable son of a guns. They will find a way to figure it out. They will still scam no matter what. Further still, if we were to be in the mode of banning things that lose people lots of money, then there are a few things that come to mind that may need attention that are totally legal, by the way. Try the lottery for one, which is a government sponsored way to, for the average everyday person to flush their earnings down the toilet in the interest of astronomical odds on winning a fortune or the stock market and the countless examples within it over the last several years where retail investors have lost their shirts on hopeless penny stocks, SPACs, and other trash that's been made available to them on the premise of easy gains and that evaporated before their eyes. My point is not that all these things are bad and should be banned. The world is rife with ways to lose or waste one's money and the answer is not to embark on a hopeless crusade to ban these things but instead to educate those who would stand to lose their money by making those poor decisions to ensure that they don't fall into these same traps in these scams you have people deliberately paying a fraudster or scammer who's promising some insane returns that are too good to be true or someone pretending to be a hot looking suitor that just wants a few thousand bucks in bitcoin before meeting up in person I mean, these are not scams enabled by crypto or any other value exchange method in a direct way. These are scams enabled by poor decision making and a lack of education as to how these scams are perpetrated. You don't learn this stuff in school, right? You aren't taught personal finance, how to avoid scams, what's too good to be true and how to make good decisions financially. But hey, you learn about Mesopotamia, so there's that. I mean, seriously though, scammers are gonna do whatever they can to trick people into sending money in some form or fashion, whether it be gift card codes, gold and silver coins, V-Bucks vouchers on Fortnite, or whatever else. Beating the scammers is going to take a lot more than regulating crypto, and it's a 404 logic not found to equate the two and say, without crypto, you won't have scams. Next up, let's check out some crypto news stories from the past week. We'll kind of go around the different areas of the space. I've got a few headlines to cover, so let me jump on the computer and we can dive into the news stories for the day. All right, so we've got a, a few stories on the books today. The first one is from Cointelegraph, and this story reads, the headline reads, Optimism token falls 40%, prompting calls to bar dumpers from airdrops. Quote, why should Optimism Collective continue rewarding these kind of mercenary actors who will dump their tokens on first sight? Why should any future airdrops reward these addresses? An OP governance member argued. And so this is a really interesting sort of uh, philosophical debate because here you have this environment where airdrops are very popular, right? That's just the truth. Tokens are distributed to people and let's be real, please, please know that airdrops are generally pretty darn risky. There's also regulatory implications and tax implications. So just be aware of that. Don't go chasing airdrops. But the biggest thing is that this is sort of this debate where should governance be focused on banning and excluding people that are just dumping tokens? And this is a tricky one because you think about it for a second and you look at this, the idea of this open borderless environment where anyone can access these things and everyone has an equal shot, right? Then you look at governance. Should governance be used to bar people by address from using a service? Is that even effective? Because if you have an airdrop being banned to a certain address, can someone simply move and circumvent that by moving to another address and claiming airdrops there? There are obviously ways to work around that based on contribution. Maybe the airdrop is based off of your holdings at a certain point in time uh, on, in Ether or whatever else. My main point is there is this debate of whether or not governance by the, the people who own tokens should be used to ban people from receiving cryptocurrency from the protocol or ban people from using something. What this really is, if you really think about it, is regulation by governance. And it's very interesting, the difference in philosophy that people have at times between regulation from 
a government versus regulation from what is effectively an on-chain government. The difference, of course, is that this is sort of by the people in this case, but I think it's a slippery slope to start banning people from being a participant in this particular solution, especially when it comes down to um, doing it by address and basically uh, blocking someone from receiving these airdrops. What you probably could do is to establish vesting into the process for these drops. That could be done via smart contracts. But it's very complex. I'd like to hear your, your thoughts on this. Is it perfectly reasonable for community governance to vote by majority to ban certain addresses? Or is it not really what we should be doing? Is it a slippery slope? You tell me. The next story is from Cointelegraph as well. And this is a really interesting one. The former product manager at OpenSea charged with insider trading. The charges are related to digital collectibles bought and sold on the NFT marketplace in September 2021. So if you remember back at the end of last year, still kind of at the height of the hype cycle for NFTs and crypto, there was this whole thing about the product manager at OpenSea uh, being caught through on-chain sleuths, at least this is how I remember it, um, buying NFTs and collections that were going to be soon on the front page of OpenSea. And then after those NFT assets made it onto the front page and got their little bump in price because they were on the front page, that same wallet was selling and then rolling back the, reward, the, the rewards, the profits into a wallet owned by that product manager, a, a known wallet address. This of course constitutes insider trading. He had material non-public information of what's gonna be on the front page and was trading that and making a profit and basically dunking on and abusing the community because the community is funding these profits by buying what's on the front page. Now, this is, first of all, an ethical dilemma. Of course, it's very obvious. A lot of people are saying, oh, it's not insider trading because NFTs aren't securities. Well, uh, this charge is actually, uh, or, or these charges, plural, is an indicator that that is not the case. It is still insider trading. This is the thing that's interesting, and this is not an original opinion. I, I've seen other people saying this, so I'm not claiming I'm coming up with some sort of revelation of, of, of analysis here. But the result of this case, first of all, is that NFTs and crypto are not this sort of bastion where you can get away with anything. Okay, that's the first thing. The bigger one, though, is this court case could determine, these charges could set a precedent that NFTs are securities, or at least some NFTs are securities, and that would be very significant. So I think this is something that we really need to watch. And to be honest with you, this just really kind of goes to show that there is a lot more scrutiny being pointed towards this space. The bigger that it grows, we had a $3 trillion market cap in this last cycle. It's no longer this small space that's not big enough to really matter. No one really cares about it. It's just a few people. Now it's big. It's a lot of people. I think the numbers were like 12% or 14% of people, of adults in the United States had used or invested in cryptocurrency. I mean, that's a significant portion of people. So the times of us being sort of a uh, fringe, not really uh, that interesting to regulators and governments and law enforcement, that time is now over. This case is a great example of that. So we shall see how this pans out, but it, it'll be a significant, uh, significant one to watch. The next story is from Coindesk. As always, with all the pop-ups, very annoying. <laughs> the headline reads, quote, the Google of blockchains is sunsetting its centralized service. The Graph announced it will urge developers to migrate to its Ethereum-based indexer network as it shuts down its centralized service by early 2023. Now, I think this is indica indicative, excuse me, of a move that you're gonna see from a lot more organizations that have centralized services that operate sort of in tandem with their decentralized option. So the graph, for those of you who are unfamiliar, it is a an indexer service that takes on-chain data and creates an indexing service that's queryable via GraphQL. It's a sort of query language. And it is extremely effective, extremely useful, and it's used by tons of protocols. Say you wanna track an, an address and its NFT ownership. You don't wanna be making on-chain calls all the time to do that. You can build an index of that address and the NFTs that it owns. You can do this for DeFi protocols, basically on-chain data, making it accessible and useful for different applications. That's the bread and butter of the graph. 
in a highly simplified manner. Now, they have this sort of um, curation rewards environment where you can, uh, as someone who wants to contribute to this network, this decentralized network, curate indexes of different things. It could be uh, cryptocurrency uh, prices, it could be uh, token balances, it can be all sorts of different data from on-chain. But what you need to know is this decentralized network is focused on providing that service in a decentralized economy. The graph has for a while run um, sort of a centralized service, an offering where you can access um, indexes or graphs, subgraphs as they call them, to do all sorts of things with data directly through them. So they're stopping that and they're basically saying everyone use the decentralized service. This is indicative, again, like I said before, of what is going to start to happen for a lot of these different things. It's going to be, we've built a product that we're proud of. We aren't going to be the custodian of it, though. We're not going to have a centralized offering that you have to come to us for. Use a decentralized network. We're going to be an open source community that supports this, or even a centralized company, or a DAO, probably, that supports it. Very cool stuff. The Graph is a project that I'm very fond of, both as a user, as a developer, but also just as a, a utility. They've built something really, really, really valuable in this space that I think is going to be continued to, to be emulated by other ecosystems around the blockchain space. So keep a close eye on the Graph. I think the Graph is gonna be around for a long time, and it's one of those cryptocurrencies that I'm still invested in in terms of an altcoin, uh, even if it doesn't go up in price like crazy, I'm a huge fan of it. And so when I have high conviction in something and I think it's valuable, it solves a problem, I invest in it. Not financial advice. And the last story of the day is from Cointelegraph. Again, lots of Cointelegraph today. Uh, this story reads, Japan passes bill to limit stablecoin issuance to banks and trust companies. The Japanese government is rushing to enforce new stablecoin laws in the aftermath of the Terra collapse. Now we talked about this a few weeks ago when we did a sort of debrief on what happened with Terra and Luna. This is not surprising, and this is probably going to happen in many more places. After the Terra Luna fiasco, you have an algorithmic stablecoin that is backed by endogenous collateral, uh, by arbitrage between Luna, this cryptocurrency asset, and then USD, the stablecoin. It, I've already said I made a mistake in thinking that they've made it sustainable by creating demand for UST and this, this, and that, trying to fix the issues with Anchor Protocol. I was totally wrong on that. Well documented. Many people were wrong on this. The thing is, now that this happened, and this was a massive event, this lost a lot of people, a lot of money. Now that this happened, regulators are going to now act because it's the perfect opportunity for them to do so. And so, of course, now it's we are going to limit the issuance of stable coins, which should be stable and should be trustworthy and should be transparent to the trusted entities that a lot of people know today, which to the government is banks, of course, and other, what, what did they call it in the story? Trust companies, okay? So what this really means is that you're gonna have the era of regulated stable coins starting to take over. And it's gonna be very interesting to see the push and pull because I think there really needs to be decentralized stable coins. Of course, you don't want stable coins that are completely unstable or that are prone to getting crushed through a bank run like we saw with Terra and UST, but you do need decentralized stable coins. That is my opinion. But seeing this story, seeing Japan, who is a little bit more aggressive in this space, you're likely going to see the same thing being emulated in the West. You're going to see this being emulated across different countries in Southeast Asia, I have a feeling, because a lot of people do not want to see a repeat of this happening. And it's a sort of vacuum in which you can get a little bit of support, even from people in crypto, to do this, to stomp out trash like this, like stuff like, like, like happened with Terra. So I think my main point here is not that, oh, so let's celebrate this. My point is, this is coming. And this is the first real tangible indication that I've seen in terms of something that's passed, not just been proposed, that is limiting the issuance of stable coins to trusted entities or banks, right? And I'm sure there's gonna be a definition of how much collateral needs to be actually in an account, how many assets actually need to back those stable coins to prevent huge blowups like we just saw. So point being, keep a close eye on this and we'll see how this pans out 
but you're going to start to see a lot more focus and a lot more talk on USDC, and you're seeing some concern around Tether, this is going to be a reckoning for stable coins, and it's going to be one of the big narratives for us to be watching throughout this year and into next year as we set up for the next big phase for crypto growth. Now, that is going to do it for Crypto Over Coffee today. Again, I'm trying out new formats for the show, trying slightly longer, slightly shorter, moving Q&A out into different episodes, uh, changing the format, doing one big story instead of a bunch of small ones. So really, please, in the comments, let me know what you prefer. Let me know what you like. Because throughout the bear market, throughout crypto winter, I'm still going to be creating content. So I want to make sure it's content that you want to watch, that you want to see. So let me know in the comments what you like, what you don't like, and I will uh, tune it accordingly. So thank you so much for watching. Hope you and your family have a wonderful rest of your weekend and weekend ahead or week ahead. And until next time, cheers.